Well, welcome to the More to Historic podcast. I am so glad that you all have come along. It means a lot to me that people are checking this out and the various things that we're producing. I have a great show for you today. This is a book that I wish I had been I had access to. I just found out that it actually was available 20 years ago, but now it's in a new form published by Seedbed and Zondervan, Why I'm Still Surprised by the Power of the Spirit, Discovering How God Speaks and Heals Today with Jack Deere. And we're going to hear from him in just a minute. But before we do that, I want to make sure you know this podcast is brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. And just recently, we've got the news that we are approved by the Global Methodist Church for our course of study and as an institution as a whole. So we're looking forward to engaging more folks in the Global Methodist uh, Church going forward, in addition to people across denominational lines. We're not affiliated with one particular denomination at Wesley Biblical Seminary. Instead, we take that tradition that we are part of in the in the Wesleyan Holiness Movement, and we're excited to be able to serve people who are serving as leaders in churches all around the world. So we'd love for you to find out more about us at wbs.edu. Secondly, I'm thankful to my friend and Bill Roberts for being a sponsor of this podcast. You can find out more about him and his financial ministry as he helps people plan and get to their retirement goals in a Christian way at williamhroberts.com. And lastly, I just want to make sure you know that if you join my email list at andymillerthethird.com, that's andymillerii.com, I have a free resource there for people called Five Steps to Deeper Teaching and Preaching. It's a 45-minute video course along with an eight-page guide to help people go deeper into biblical text with the aim of presenting that in an engaging way. And I'd love to share that with you if you go to my website and sign up for my email list at andymillerthethird.com. All right. I am so glad to welcome into the podcast, Jack Deere, who is a former professor. He's an author, a conference speaker, um, somebody who serves a, as a pastor and has written this new, new to me book, Why I'm Still Surprised by the Power of the Spirit, Discovering How God Speaks and Heals Today. Jack, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Andy. Glad to be here. I tell you, I, I wasn't aware of this book, and I, sadly, I was not able to, to attend the New Room Conference this past fall, but my in-laws did. And when I went to their house for um, Thanksgiving break, my mother-in-law put your book on my bedside table, and I was fascinated by it. I wish I had come upon it earlier, but this is in part just uh, it tells your story of moving through a process of being in ministry, serving as a professor, but then becoming more engaged with the work of the spirit. And it's a, it seems in some ways like an unlikely story, but I one that I hope will encourage people. Could you tell us a little bit about, about this book in general and your experience? Yeah, it, it's really uh, an argument, that, uh, but, but told in stories and using the Bible to support those stories that God is still speaking and still healing like he did in the uh, in the New Testament times and that and then and that he really wants to be friends with us but you can't be friends with someone if you can't talk to them if you can't hear their voice so it's a, a book uh, uh, not just about miracles but it's about hearing God's voice and about having a, uh, a friendship with him so that's really what the book is about but I start with my story but I, I wasn't raised in a, in a christian home i was raised in a traumatic home mom and dad were at war uh from the time about five or six years old and my dad ended the war when i was 12 by killing himself oh my. and he left a 34 year old widow with a 10th grade education to care for his four kids i was the oldest at 12. Wow. and in texas in 1961 there's no way a woman without a high school education is going to be able to support four kids and wow. so we just saw, and mom was really pretty. So we just saw this parade of men come through our homes, men and alcohol. Uh, that's what I grew up with in my early uh, teen years. And we kids saw things in our home kids should never, ever see. And I became a wild kid. Uh, my, uh, I, had, uh, I was part of a group of eight athletes and all of us came from broken homes or homes that were in the process of breaking. And we had zero supervision over us. And I had zero morality. There was nothing I obeyed. I stole wow. all my clothes because I, I couldn't have, I wanted and uh, sexually immoral. Uh, we drank all the time. The one thing I wouldn't do is I wouldn't use drugs then because my group thought that was just absolutely stupid. My brother became the best drug dealer in the high school. So I was just a, uh, a class away 
from becoming a, uh, a druggie. So, and, and we, my, my parents never went to church. They not only had no Christian friends, they had no friends. So I, I had never, I was 16 years old before I found out who Jesus Christ was. Wow. Can you imagine that? Growing up in the Bible Belt and not knowing, and when I just heard the words Jesus, I heard them as swear words. Wow. And, and so, uh, or Jesus Christ, those were swear words. And I had no idea he was a historical person until I saw in the, in the spring of 1965, um, when I was uh, 16 years old, I saw the greatest story ever told. Okay, and, yeah. Uh, and the, the, the critics said, it was the greatest story ever told. It was probably the worst movie ever made. <laughs> uh, but for me, for me, it was revelatory. I mean, he was a real person. And then wow. they crucified him. Why did he go and do that? He was such yeah. a nice guy. Uh, and I don't, if they had a resurrection, I don't, I didn't get that. But I, I didn't get the meaning of the crucifixion or right. anything. That was the extent of my Christian knowledge. And I had, and I never went to church. And my smartest friend, who was part of our group, he was the one guy you could actually talk to about ideas. Uh, he chased a blonde named Dixie to church camp, and he didn't catch Dixie, but he caught religion. The worst kind. Southern Baptist hellfire damnation. And he <laughs> came back telling all of us that we should uh, stop drinking, that we should stop using girls. Uh, and we go, we'll see you, Bruce. Wouldn't want to be you. And we excommunicated him from our group. But he, he prayed for me for 18 months, and uh, we wouldn't have anything to do with him. One night, just to meet some new girls, I spent the night at his house, and I asked him, how do you get into heaven? Now, I asked wow. my dad that question when I was nine years old, and the worst thing that my dad ever did to me was not killing himself. It was what he told me when I asked him how to get into heaven. What he you said, say? when you die... When you die, you go up to heaven and you stand before the gates outside heaven. Yeah. St. Peter comes out to meet you with the book of all your good deeds and a book of all your bad deeds. He mm. sets a pair of scales on the table. He puts the good deeds on one side, bad deeds on the other. If the good deeds go down, you go up. Oh but my. if the bad deeds go down, so do you, and you will burn in hell forever and ever. And he described the caverns of hell to me. I was wow. nine years old when I heard that, and that's when I gave up on God. Wow. And so okay. I, I had no hope of my good deeds ever outweigh my bad deeds. So I thought, well, I'm going to hell. I might as well enjoy it. Oh, and, my. Uh, so I had zero morality. Uh, lying to a friend, I'd do it in a heartbeat if I thought it was an advantage to me. I mean, just stealing whatever I wanted, no sexual morality, uh, getting drunk all the time. Uh, that was where, where I was headed. And Bruce, this one, this one smart friend that you could talk to about ideas, mm -hmm. he becomes a Christian. We excommunicate him from our group. And on December 18th, 1965, I was 17 years old, and, I, and he conned me into spending the night at his house yeah. on, the, on the promise of meeting these two new beautiful girls from, from Pasco High School. That was the wealthy high school on the west side of Fort Worth. We went yeah. to Eastern Hills, the poor high school on the east side of Fort Worth. Yeah. So I, to meet these two girls, I spent the night with them. And about two in the morning, I just asked him that same question. I asked my dad. I, I said, uh, Bruce, how do you think you get into heaven? And it yeah. was just like, it was an, all I wanted was opinion. I wasn't in, really interested in going to heaven or anything. And he said, Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. Yeah. I had never heard that before. Amazing. He's like, how do you live in the Bible Belt and never hear that? Well, you have to have a Christian friend or you have to go to church. And I didn't either. Bruce wow. was my first Christian friend. He said, he died for you. And if you will trust him to forgive you and give you a new life, he will come into your heart and never leave. Mm. And the part that got me was the never leave. Sure. When you're 17 years old and everyone you've ever loved has left you, Right. To hear that the greatest person in the universe won't leave you, that's good news. Amen. And uh, that, that was the part that got me. And, and so I, when I heard that, I prayed my first prayer. It was a silent prayer, but it was this. It was, God, I'm coming over to your side now. I didn't wow. tell Bruce about it. I just said, well, thanks, Bruce. And I rolled over and went to sleep. Uh, and then uh, about five days later, six days later, uh, I called Bruce and I said, hey, I don't know what you guys call this, uh, but uh, 
whatever it is, I, I want to come over to God's side. And he goes, Jackie, <laughs> don't go anywhere. <laughs> like he's afraid I might change my mind before he could get to my house. Yeah. And he ran over to my house, took a King James Bible out, showed me what it meant to be born again in John 3, and says, you've been born again. That's why you're feeling different now. And, uh, and that began my Christian life. I, I joined the same church, which was a Southern Baptist church, because that's where Bruce went. And a young life leader named Scott Manley, who was phenomenal. He was like everything I wanted to be. He'd have been a college wrestler. So his arms bulged, his shirt sleeves. He was huh. handsome. He was articulate. Uh, he was funny. He was, a, he was a young life leader, and he took me to his young life club. And I watched him hold 125 kids right in the palm of his hand. I mean, he was just an amazing speaker. And, and Scott became my spiritual father, big brother, best friend, all rolled into one, taught me how to study Bible, how to, how to memorize scripture. I memorized the whole navigator system because that's what he, what he was memorizing. And uh, oh, and uh, he introduced me to C.S. Lewis, and I fell in love with C.S. Lewis yeah. as an 11th grade high school student. And before I got out of college, I'd read all of C.S. Lewis's Christian books, and then eventually all of his literary books as well. Interesting. Uh, and all that was due to one discipler, uh, Scott Manley. And I became a young life leader just like him, ended up becoming a Dallas Seminary student, not because I wanted to be a pastor. I couldn't stay in church. I thought it was duller than dust. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to learn the Bible. I learned. I met some Dallas Seminary guys who knew the Bible backwards and forwards. And I go, where did you guys learn how to do that? And they yeah. said, oh, Dallas Seminary, you study every book in the Bible before you get out. So I went to Dallas Seminary, and it turned out when I got to Dallas Seminary, I was a whiz at Greek and Hebrew. I didn't know that. So I, I basically had C's and D's and F's on my high school card, but it turned out that all things Greek, Hebrew, Latin, uh, throw, throw in Aramaic, Arabic, all those kind of things were fascinating to me. And I was a whiz at it. And so by the time I graduated from Dallas Seminary, I was a Greek and Hebrew major. I could read significant portions of the Bible in Greek and in Hebrew. And, I be, and, I, and they invited me to become a professor of Old Testament exegesis and Semitic languages there. So I spent the next 12 years teaching those languages at Dallas Seminary, past, starting a church that today has about 17,000 people in it. I'm not wow. there anymore. What um, church is that? It's called Christ Chapel. It's in Fort Worth, Texas. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, I, brought, I, I led my best friend to the Lord, and I ended up bringing my best friend to the church who, who pastored the church till he um, retired. Uh, but, but I got kind of kicked out of the evangelical world for a while because I started believing in the gifts of the Spirit. Not because I saw a miracle or a healing, um, but I was uh, studying the Bible and uh, actually studying the Bible to prove the gifts were wrong and, and came to the conviction that God was still speaking today, that he was still healing, and that all the gifts of the Spirit were for today. And when I came to that conviction and just believed those things, I hadn't done anything yet, right. I believed those things, uh, God sent a man named John Wimber into my life. Amazing. Who was like the, 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 the world-class trainer, not, not the believer, but trainer in the gifts of the spirit. He was more practical than anyone I'd ever seen. And he became my, my spiritual father and best friend. And that process started all over again with him, showing me how to hear God's voice, how to pray for healing. I mean, I went with Wimber and I saw blind eyes open. I mean, wow. immediately, right there when he prayed for people. Uh, I, I just saw deaf ears open. I saw people get out of wheelchairs, crooked bones straightened. Um, you know, and, I, and not by shouting and yelling, but just by these just normal uh, prayers. And, and, and so my friendship with Wimber was a huge embarrassment to my seminary. And because I wouldn't give up the friendship with Wimber, they fired me after wow. uh, being there for like 18 years. Wow. Uh, they, they fired me. And so I went to Anaheim and stayed with Wimber for about four or five years. And he had a church of 5,000. It was one of the best churches I've ever seen, the uh, most effective church in training for the gifts of the Spirit. I went all around the world with him. I met Anglicans. I mean, the, the, whole, ch the whole church loved Wimber, the church that did the gifts of the Spirit. Now, the church that hated the gifts of the Spirit, they hated John Wimber. They saw him as enemy number one. But I, right. I met people I would never have met, leaders, world leaders I would never have met had it not been for uh, John Wimber. And then wow. I started writing, and the book became bestsellers, translated into lots of languages. And uh, then I started 
start speaking around the world like Wimber. Wow. Now, it's interesting. John Wimber's coming up more in people's uh, conversations now, at least for me, as a result of some of the things that have been happening. For instance, uh, I'm not sure when this podcast will be released, but we had the revival at Asbury University, where uh, my, my seminary is very connected to that. I went to both Asbury institutions, and it's recalling people's attention to the um, – revivals in California in uh, 72 yeah. in the Jesus revolution. Now, John Wimber is not mentioned in that movie, but he's connected to that same movement. Is that right? That's true. Yeah, he was a Wimber was a major leader and a major discipler. He he was a person you wanted to be around. He was funny. He was real. He wasn't religious at all. Uh, he, he was amazing. So, yeah, he was uh, he was like a the, the, the spiritual father discipler of Lonnie Frisbee, who was like the power man in the Jesus yeah. movement. He went astray later with uh, with sexual sins and all that. But uh, Wimber had been his kind of leader, and he was in Wimber's church until Wimber disciplined him for sexual sins that he wouldn't repent of. Wow. Interesting. So th th this uh, coalescing of these various things, like you're you're beginning to believe in this, you're, in your sense that, hey, I have to read this differently. I mean, this had to be an amazing moment for you to have to stand up and say, no, I affirm this. And it, did you know it would lead you to losing your job? No. In fact, somebody somebody said, oh, oh, <laughs> this is so funny. So uh, I met Wimber. He, he came to my town and, and someone said, yeah, you should go meet him. So so I go to this Baptist church where he's speaking and, and I, I meet him and I was just totally impressed with him. He reminded me of a great young life leader, not pretentious, talked about his sins, uh, was dressed really casually, came out in tennis shoes, shirt tail hanging out, um, just like a young life leader. And, and uh, so I went up and met him afterwards and uh, it, and he goes, oh, I heard about you. And he goes, you're the South Seminary guy that, that, that believes in me. Uh, uh, yes. And I go, yeah, that's me. And he goes, yeah, John White told me about you. John White was a professor friend that we had in common. And uh, he said, well, Jack, uh, I uh, want to tell you that if you go any further with me, you're most likely going to lose your church. Wow. And you're going to be fired by your seminary. And I'm thinking, oh, man, he does not know how articulate I am <laughs> and how I can in my positions. But if I say that, it'll sound arrogant. Yeah. <laughs> I go, it'll sound arrogant. You know, that's what, like, I'm not an arrogant person. And, <laughs> um, it, and so I said, like, so I can't tell him that. Um, so what I say to him is, well, John, I'm a pastor, right? He goes, well, yeah. And, and I said, and so pastor should be healing, right? He goes, right. And I said, and there's probably nobody that could teach me this better than you. And he says, well, yeah, that's probably right. And given that relationship, and he, and I said, well, my course is set, and even if it costs me my church and my job at the seminary, and he goes, well, if that's the way you feel about it, okay. Uh, so here's how it works: uh, you call, I will take you and Lisa to any conference I do anywhere in the world. I will pay for your flights. I'll pay for your hotel. I'll pay for all your food. You just call business manager Steve. Tell him what you need. And, uh, and I will train you in the gifts of the spirit. You can be with me everywhere I go. And, uh, and that was it. That was the beginning of our friendship. And that lasted for about a year before the seminary went ballistic. And, uh, and, and the, the president of the seminary, uh, I, I was actually friends with him. His kids had been in our Young Life Club, so he loved me, and he mm. loved Young Life. And, and I, was, I was a whiz. You know, I was one of the great students. I mean, one of their, like, role models. And I've become a great professor. I had, I had really high recommendations from, from my uh, students. So I taught Hebrew and, and sometimes Greek. Uh, and uh, and so we, we went out to lunch and he said, Jack, out of the last 10 days, I've had calls from within the country and outside the country about you. And they asked me how I can continue to let you stay on the faculty when you're in such obvious sympathy with a man like John Wimber. He goes, I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. And uh, so I said, oh, man, I'm sorry to be uh, uh, this kind of burden to you. And about uh, maybe within a month, he called me into his office and he said, here's the deal. You have to renounce your friendship with John Wimber. John Wimber. Yeah. 
and basically what he stands for, or you have to resign from the seminary. And I go, I'm not going to resign from the seminary. I'm a, I'm a good professor. I get high ratings from the students. I've been faithful for all these years. I go, yeah. I'm not resigning from the seminary. You're trying to get me to take responsibility for something you want to do, and I'm not going to do it. And they go, Jack. He says, Jack, we'll fire you if you don't give up your friendship with uh, Wimber and you, and you refuse to resign, we'll fire you. And I said, well, that's what you're going to have to do. And so they did. They fired me wow. for my friendship with Wimber. Later, they said it was for practicing the gifts of the Spirit, but I wasn't doing anything like that at the time in, in the seminary or even in my church, which was a wow. Bible church. I was just going to conferences with uh, with Wimber. So they, they fired me for my friendship with Wimber, but that sounds really bad to say that. Uh, so they didn't want to say that publicly, but that's why I was fired. Wow. And then, then I, I started writing books that became bestsellers, started speaking, uh, started a, a, a church or actually took over a dying church and taught people how to move in the gift of the spirit. And the wow. rest is history. Well, Jack, I mean, so so you have come from a different perspe perspective than a lot of folks who, because you were in that world, you were a, a leader in that world. I mean, kind of like to be yeah. a, a seminary professor at DTS, a well-known school that's well-respected, uh, uh, has like a network of connections, not just in the Bible church world, but all over. So you get where a lot of people are coming from. And, and that's a, a little bit of my experience too, even though the movement I was a part of, I grew up in the Salvation Army. Actually, I led the Salvation Army in Arlington, not far away from probably where you are now in Tarrant County. Um, and and the, the beginning of the Salvation Army had a lot of these expressions that would be thought of as charismatic. It was like kind of pre-Azusa Street, but nevertheless, that was a when you go back and read the original things that were happening, it was very much like this. But still, there's a there's a bit of a resistance. Uh, not a bit, a resistance in, in some of the denominations connected to the holiness movement that didn't move towards Pentecostalism. And, it, and but yet, like there's, and, and some of that comes from excesses, like excesses of saying that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is manifested in speaking in tongues or something like that. And so then that blocks out some of the ways that we even are able to read scripture and like to understand the necessity of, of praying for healing. And so in my own ministry as survey, before I became a teacher on seminary uh, level, I was, um, we started to just move towards praying for healings, seeking if the Holy Spirit was speaking, giving room for the Spirit to speak in services. And I, I felt like a nut for not getting there sooner. Like why I love as a pastor praying for healing in people's lives. But what is it that, like, why is it that Christians like don't believe in miracles? <laughs> don't believe in this work of the Spirit. I'd love to he hear you help, like walk people through how they can experience God speaking today. Well, I, I think for it, it's the brand of Christianity that some of us are brought up in. And, and for me, it was all about the mind. Uh, yeah. So it was about memorizing scripture, knowing scripture. It was about the mind. And when you, uh, when you say God can speak today outside of scripture, then you open up this whole area of the subjective. And like, right. well, how do you know those thoughts are coming from him? How do you know you're not making it up? Well, you grow in those areas, just like you, like you go. So, uh, you know, when I first met my wife, uh, I couldn't tell you what she was thinking. But the deeper our relationship gets, uh, most of the time, I don't even have to ask how she's feeling. I know uh, we can communicate without necessarily saying uh, sentences. And it's the same way with the, with the Lord. The, the Bible is the number one way he speaks. I, I, I've always believed that. I still believe that. But he can also, if you look in the Bible, he can speak and, you know, tell Paul that he, he wants him and Silas to go on a mission uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, and so I was just arguing those kind of things are still valid today. The Bible is still the number one way he speaks, but he can, he can uh, speak to our spirits. And then I'm explaining to people uh, how to do it. But because it's opening up this area that you, you can't control like you, like you think you can control, the interpretation of scripture, it, it becomes uh, subjective. And that's what we hated. We hated the, the, uh, the subjective, the emotional. We hated feelings. <laughs> In fact, you know, we have, there were lots of sermons I heard at Dallas about how bad feelings were. But you know what? Um, love is an action. It's also a feeling. <laughs> yeah. If, if, 
if you, if you don't have that feeling, I don't know. I mean, you know, it, feeling is part of love. I mean, just ask anyone who's ever been in love. I mean, how, how are you in love without the feeling? Um, yeah, yeah. So we were death on feelings. And that was the one of the big deals to us. And then the other thing is the charismatic excesses, you know, saying everybody should speak in tongues. I don't believe that uh, today. Right. Uh, but you put that burden on people, and then you got people going shoebox, robo, lobo. They're just saying words. It's not really tongues and uh, kind of having to fake it because they're told if you're really spiritual, you'll do it. Oh, and then telling people that if you've got enough faith, you can be healed. That's just cruel. Mm. Uh, I don't believe in the Bible God healed everyone, and I don't believe that it's his desire to heal everyone today. I believe we should pray for healing, but sometimes he'll tell me, that he's not going to heal the person, but he, uh, it, it, but he'll give me a message or something for them uh, uh, to help them. And uh, to me, that's way more authentic Christianity than the, the version that says, "Well, you got to speak in tongues to have power, uh, and you got to uh, and you can be healed if you have enough faith. If you if you're not healed, you just don't have enough faith." That is cruel to say to someone uh, who is struggling. And this whole idea that baptism of the Spirit is something that's separate from your salvation experience, it, it, it's, it's completely wrong. Yeah. Uh, we are, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. It's not about getting us into this exclusive realm of power that other Christians don't experience. Baptism is immersing us in the Holy Spirit, in the body of Christ, yeah. and it happens to every single uh, Christian. And the Spirit will empower Christians, uh, obviously, and He'll empower some more than others. And a lot of that depends on faith. A lot of that depends on desire. And a lot of it depends on us willing to take chances and fail. Yeah. You do a great job in the book working through the kind of cessationist history of how this came about. And you trace it back to John Calvin yeah. and, and then go through B.B. Warfield, and you have some conclusions on that. I I know we don't have time for that. And I just encourage people to get the book and check this out to get it like this really concise description. Cause it's not something that should can easily just like be summarized, but I would love for you just to hit some of those major points that you hit in the book about those areas of what happened historically to produce this uh, cessationist um, worldview. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the modern denial of the gifts of the spirit probably goes back to the reformation when Calvin and Luther were fighting with the Catholics, they were breaking away with the Catholics. I'm not saying every Catholic, but in a lot of the Catholics, there was this works concept of salvation that was uh, per pervasive. And the fact that you could lose salvation, that was also per pervasive. And uh, so John uh, and, and Luther pointed to, we're justified by faith. You know, they, they, they quoted Romans 3 and Romans 5, and it means you're declared righteous. and, and uh, in the, uh, in the Catholics said, what proof do you have that your interpretation is right? We right. have miracles back up our interpretation, and, and miracles do not support interpretations of Scripture, but that's what they said at the time. And so the, the Reformers, they actually weren't praying for miracles, so they weren't seeing them. Uh, and so instead of arguing that miracles don't support uh, doctrine or prove that doctrine is true, what the Reformers argued was that all the miracles have passed away, which mm. is a huge mistake. So they, they started coming up, and they were smart, and, and they probably knew the Bible better than the Catholics. And so they started coming up with biblical arguments why the miracles had been done away. Okay, well, so I'm a, uh, I'm a son, you know, a, a distant son of formers. And, and, and so at Dallas, we just used those arguments, and we came up with more arguments uh, and, and tried to root them in Scripture uh, to say that the gifts weren't being given. So that's something we inherited. It's not something that we would have come to on our own, and the Reformers wouldn't have come to it on their own unless they had been in conflict with their enemies, and they didn't see a way out of that conflict except to deny the miracles and, and yeah. say that uh, e either the miracles were being performed by Satan to deceive us or that the Catholics were just lying. Wow. So I'd li like to make it just a little shift toward thinking about how people can incorporate uh, these type of emphases 
in their churches today, like uh, healing. And also I, I want to make sure to talk about demonization. That's something you cover in the book that I find really helpful. But um, like what, what could a pastor who's saying, man, everything Jack's saying, I resonate with, I just don't know what to do. Like how do I start to emphasize the work of the spirit and the continuing work of the spirit in the life of our church? Okay, so a couple things are really important here. Number one, uh, if a church is going to believe in the gifts of the Spirit and start practicing them, and one of the reasons for not practicing them is there's no way to escape the messy nature of practicing the gifts of the Spirit. It's just okay. messy. Um, so, uh, so if a church is going to do that, it has to start with the leadership of the church. One of the worst things I see is people come into like a conference I do and go, oh man, Jack sure convinced me out when we saw it. We saw a guy got out of a wheelchair. We saw deaf ears open. If they weren't lying, you know, they were, they, they were giving their hearing aids up. And that actually happens at conferences I do. <clears throat> and so uh, the, so they're, they're convinced. Now, so they go back to their church, they tell their pastor, he's not in favor of it, but they start trying to pray for the sick in the church and create a subversive meeting within the church without the pastor's blessing. And that mm -hmm. usually ends up sooner or later, them and maybe a few other people having to go away and then they start a church. So you, you have to have, if you're, if you're going to have the gifts of the spirit come into a church, it, they, you have to have the leadership wanting it and, and uh, eventually leading it for it yes. to, to work. So that's the first thing. So don't, don't go split your church. Uh, if, if trying to get them to believe in the gifts of the spirit, if the leadership doesn't want to find a church that already believes them and go there and be a blessing to them and, and not uh, trouble to, you know, to, to your church that doesn't believe them. So that, that's the uh, first thing. Okay. Um, so uh, that, that uh, means for most of us that we're going to have to change churches if our church doesn't believe in the gifts of the spirit. Right. And so I, I suggest going to a church that believes in them and that, that you like that don't join the church. You want to change. Okay. <laughs> Please spare the pastor and the elders that pain <laughs> join a church that you like it. Like it is right uh, right now. And it moves in the gifts. Let the pastor know that you want to do that. But the absolute best way to move into gifts of the spirit. So you're in a church that believes in it. It's, we're not going to practice the gifts of the Spirit on Sunday morning. That's okay. the best way in the world to turn people off. And I said <laughs> practice. Like you were going to, here, we're going to try to learn how to do the gifts. You know, we, we, we do the practice time. We learn how to use the gifts in home groups. Okay. This is the safest way to do it. You get 15, 20 people in a home group, meets once a week. And uh, you say, okay, let's open up the meeting and, and by praying and ask the Lord to show us someone he wants us to pray for. Okay. Now, that can mean someone who's got a pain or something wrong. thought comes into your mind. You see uh, an elbow. Let's say if a picture comes into your mind. You see an elbow, and you think, yeah. oh, it's a right elbow. And you go, is that from the Lord, or am I just making that up because I, I want to have a word so bad? Well, you don't know. <clears throat> so then it comes. So then, the, so then uh, after a while, everybody's had a chance to pray, and you're all quiet. Uh, if I'm leading it, I'll say, has anybody, did anybody think they hear the Lord? And those words are important. Not did anybody hear the Lord? Did anybody yeah. think you hear the Lord? That's all we're saying. Not that I'm this awesome prophet. I just think this might have been the Lord. We're taking the low road here because um, we're all taking the road of learners. Like this is something we learn. We're not, uh, and we're admitting we could be wrong. Did anybody think? So you had this picture of the right elbow. And you go, well, you raise your hand up. I'm not sure, but I, I had this picture of a right elbow, and I just wonder if there's anything wrong with someone's right elbow here. And yeah. then someone goes, yeah, man, my right elbow has been killing me. Wow. Or it might not even be a pain. It might be something else that involves the right elbow that leads to another part of a story that's not meaningful to you because all you saw was the right elbow, but it's totally meaningful to them. And, yeah. and so that's how you, you, you start out doing it. You have to be willing to make mistakes. And when I, when I do this, I create an atmosphere where we laugh at our mistakes, where it's okay. just not like some awesome, uh, you, you either right or wrong. Or <clears throat> it's like, 
hey, we're all just learners in this. We're going to make mistakes. Let's have a good time doing it. Yeah. And we'll pray for anybody. We'll, we'll pray for anybody. You can make any prayer request you want, but we're just going to start by asking the Lord to show us uh, if there's someone here we should pray for. And then if you don't get mentioned in that, then you just tell us what you want and we'll, we'll, we'll pray for you. And those are great meetings. They're fun meetings. And you do that for, uh, you know, a few months and you're going to see in that group that you're going to see, see some wonderful things. You're going to see who has a gift of healing. All right? You're wow. going to see who has a prophetic gift. You're going to see who has a gift of helps, uh, who has a gift of a man. You're going to start to see the different gifts emerge. And then you can put those people on teams, like on evangelistic teams, healing teams, yeah. prophetic teams, and so on. Care teams that, that care for the poor. See, there are people that, that won't move in miracles, but they love caring for the poor. They love taking food to underpasses. They love bandaging up the poor. That's where they're fulfilled. They, they have a gift of helps. Um, yeah, sure, sure. And so the, the goal is not to get everybody prophesying, not to get everybody healing, is to help people find their gifts. First Peter uh, four and five, uh, especially four, says everyone has received a spiritual gift. Use it in serving Christ. That, right. that is a command. You weren't given that spiritual gift. It's just an afterthought. It's part of why you were created and put on the earth. And when you start walking in your gift, you're now fully walking in the purposes for which you were put on the earth. And, and that's a great feeling. Oh, I love it. This is so helpful. I, I appreciate the real simple way that you laid this out. Like, and I hope some pastors and many pastors listening to this podcast are thinking through this and saying, okay, well, that seems pretty reasonable. Like this, I'm trying to find something for my small group to small groups to do anyways. And this also kind of takes some of the pressure off too, of having to prepare full lessons and a, basically an extra sermon or something for those small group leaders, um, just to think of how they can lean in to the spiritual gifts and then people finding fulfillment. Okay. I, I'm, I'm interested too. You have several chapters on demonization and this is something yeah. that some people are uneasy with. And in a certain degree, I, like I, the subjective element always comes into play. I was just, but this past Sunday I was serving at a church in, in Mexico and, um, I was praying for a gentleman who had been involved with witchcraft and he's, he told me this long story and all of a sudden, and I didn't necessarily recognize at the moment that it was likely a person is demon possessed. I, I'm Jack, I'm just sharing with you like where I'm at. Like I've just not been in some of these traditions and the pastor who is much more familiar with this kind of recognized where things were and, and took it under control. So help somebody like me who, who I believe that this can happen. And I'm just trying to figure out how to, serve in a way that can really help people in and these environments. Support. Yeah. Uh, so um, this is one of the uh, areas that's really abused, uh, blaming things on demons, seeing demons when there are no demons there, um, that, that sort of thing. And uh, so I've eyes, you know, caution here, going slow. And, and uh, the, the, here's how we encountered our first demon. Lisa and I were praying for a lady who had some sickness or d disease or something wrong with her. Anyway, we just laid hands on her shoulder and we were both standing there praying for her. And she goes, Ugh! And, I, and I go, what? And she says, something just ran across my chest. Okay. That was the first time a demon ever manifested while I was praying for somebody. Now I'd seen Wimber do it. Uh, Plenty of times. I'd seen uh, demons manifest when he was praying uh, for people, and I'd seen him cast out demons, and he explained a lot of this to me. And that was our first time to ever uh, encounter a demon. And, and, and so we just told it to leave in the name of Jesus, and she could feel it peeling off of her body. Um, so one way you know that someone has a demon is it, it, it will have some kind of physical manifestation in their body that's inappropriate. Uh, in other words, we weren't telling that woman to feel something in her chest. We were just praying for her to be healed, and then something went across. And, and what demons do when they manifest like that is they're trying to intimidate or scare you. Okay. Uh, but, but demons can't hurt you unless you open your life up to them. Uh, so you, 
There is no place in the Bible, in the New Testament, where you are going to see one hint that Jesus or the apostles ever feared demons, Mm -hmm. or that we're told to fear uh, demons. We're we're told to resist Satan, uh, 1 Peter 5, and he will flee from you. He doesn't like the resistance. So uh, we're we're the ones with the power, not the demons, okay? The demons got stolen power. We have real power, given from perfect power, the uh, the Lord of the universe and yes. God permits demons to steal power, but only for a time. Yeah. Their, their home is the abyss and that's where they're headed. Uh, when, when, uh, all, all this is over and, and the world separated into heaven and hell. So we don't, we don't have to fear them. I don't go looking for demons. Um, sure. The, the number one way a demon normally gets a foothold in a person is by that person's agreement with the demon. And so the the number one way, the number one foothold I see is unforgiveness. Okay. Uh, When we refuse to forgive, we're opening ourselves up to to a demonic inroad. Heaven travels on love. Hell travels on uh, curses and unforgiveness and hatred and that, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and there's warnings in the scripture about uh, if you refuse to forgive, um, you you open yourself up to a demonic power. So uh, so most of the time when I'm casting out a demon, this is not every time, uh, but most of the time when I'm casting out a demon, I'm l- looking for the cause, what how it got there, and and the most frequent cause is is unforgiveness, a person refusing okay. to forgive. And I'll, I'll say to a person, is there anybody that you, you're you not forgiving? And they go, no, no. I mean, just like that. And so I go, okay, well, let's explore that for a minute. And then we talk for a few minutes and you go, oh, well, there is this, that. And then it, then it uh, comes back to them. And, uh, and then when they forgive that person from the heart and, and forgiving from the heart is saying, God, would you forgive me for hating this person? And, and so... And some people balk at saying, well, I didn't really hate them. Uh, it was more like I just resented them. Well, n- you know, my dear friend, resentment is a form of hatred. Uh, yeah, sure. So w- let's not quibble about the words, whether it was uh, uh, hatred or just uh, disgust. <laughs> let's just say uh, if it's not love, it's hatred. Mm-hmm. And so we, we say, Lord, would you please forgive me for hating this person? Uh, and would you, uh, I, I, I choose to bless them now. I want them to become good friends with you. Uh, would you release me from this power? And then, then it's just an easy matter to get rid of that thing. And, and I, and I hate people from time to time. Uh, I've had some, uh, uh, some, uh, won't even go into details, but I, I've had some really serious attacks that have done damage to me. And, uh, and I've fallen into, uh, hatred. And I have struggled to forgive. I mean, wow. I can say the words I forgive, but it's not true. I still want bad things to happen to them. And by the way, that's how you know you hate somebody. You want something bad to happen to them, or you're really happy when something bad does happen to them. That, wow. That's hatred. Wow. And uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, so I have really struggled for that. And one of the things that helps me is when I'm having a hard time to forgive is I imagine myself up in heaven walking beside Jesus, and he's got his arm around me. And uh, I look down on earth, and I see that person I hate walking along. And I think, uh, what would Jesus want for that person? Wow. Well, yeah. he would want them to be right up here walking beside him. And, and then it, when I do that, it is really hard to continue in hating them, because it's almost like, I have to disagree with the person I love the most, that loves me the most, that has his arm around me. And so yeah. almost always, it's like a freedom to pray. Lord, I pray that that person will become one of your best friends and walk with you in heaven like this. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of how, how I do it. So in, in don't look for demons. Uh, if you suspect one that's there, uh, ask the Lord to, sh- uh, to show you. And, uh, and then if one does manifest, don't freak out. 
I guarantee you, if you pray for people as a way of life, you are going to encounter demons on a regular basis. That That's just, we never had to look for demons. I don't have to look for them today. Um, wow. And sometimes, sometimes now, I mean, I've been doing this for so long. Sometimes I can uh, look at a person and know they're demonized. Uh, and you say, how? And I, think, I just, I know, just like I know things about them. Like I can look at a person and know what they're thinking sometimes. So just, I've done this so much and I've depended on the voice of the Lord for so long and put more confidence in his ability to speak to me than in my ability to hear or analyze the situation that he just comes through on a, on, on a uh, regular basis. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how this can really happen. Like uh, the experience I just shared this past Sunday where I was preaching in this context, um, the pastor recognized that this was a demon-possessed person. Um, and, and because of a language barrier too, I think I, I was willing, I was willing to be engaged, but it was just going to be easier for them to step in and help in that situation. So uh, this is so helpful to me. You, know, you mentioned too, like kind of knowing what people might, might be thinking is one way forward to have like a word of knowledge where somebody might indicate that they have heard a message for somebody else in the room. Is that an, an entry point that might be helpful for people to be open to hearing what God wants to do? Uh, it could be, uh, it, it could be a, an entry point. Like I, I, uh, but I, but it also could be a major turnoff. Uh, it, 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 stated the wrong way a person could uh, somebody hearing it could go oh no now we're going down that charismatic road you know it could be so so the way i i do this is i say you know i was praying for the group a minute ago and i think i i just had this thing pass through my mind i think it might be the lord i'm not sure um but it might be that there's somebody in here and you've had uh significant pain in your uh in your left knee uh, and, and you think it's there because of something you did wrong or something like, like that. Anyway, those were kind of, that, does that fit anybody in here? See, and that, that is just so non-threatening. It's not like you're coming in like this big charismatic. I got, I, you know, I know this, I know that I'm an awesome prophet. It's like, you're down on the same level as everybody else here. I'm just trying to figure out what's going on here. I think this might be the case. Uh, and people don't get threatened by that. Somebody go, yeah, my left knee is hurting. And you know what? I was kind of thinking maybe God's mad at me for something. Yeah. And I go, oh, well, let's let's pray. I, I think he'll heal your knee. And I, I think that that you, you'll know he's not mad at you. And, yeah. and see, I'm always going, I think, I think. I don't go, yes. thus saith the Lord. I, I, in fact, I don't let anybody I'm training say, thus saith the Lord. Okay. You, you just can't say that. So I was telling this to one guy, I go, you cannot say, thus saith the Lord. And the young guy goes, well, Isaiah said it. And I go, oh, you got me there. Isaiah did say it. But I want you to repeat after me. I am not Isaiah. And until <laughs> you become Isaiah, you can't say, thus saith the Lord. Yeah, that's good. Well, Jack, what do you think, what do you hope for the church? Uh, like, and what do you hope can s start to happen as a result of some of this teaching that you have and this, this book and the, this emphasis of ministry? Like, what's that picture of the church that you want to see? Uh, so what I see the scriptures teaching is that the church is not going to go out with a whimper, uh, that, we're, that before the Lord comes, uh, there's going to be this great outpouring of cataclysmic evil, but also of incredible power. And there's going to be a, uh, a, a conflict, a, a huge clash. And uh, then the Lord is going to come back in the middle of those uh, outpourings. And, and ultimately, he'll be the one that rescues his church. Not our godliness, not our discipline. Uh, in the end, he's going to show us all along, it's always been him, all along. Uh, it, it's always dependent on him. So I think that's how it's going to end. I, I, I think we're going to see a greater outpouring, much greater outpouring of power than we're experiencing right now. Okay. Well, Jack, oh, thank and by you. The way, yeah, go ahead. One last thing. It's a mistake to make power the most important thing in your Christian life. The okay. most important thing is enjoying the Lord. John 15, 15, I no longer call you servants, but friends. What's yeah. the essence of friendship? It's the pleasure I feel when I'm with my best friend that I don't feel with anybody else. And what the Lord is inviting us into there is a deep friendship where we feel his joy in us. 
and we and we have pleasure in him. That's the number one goal of my life is to have a deeper friendship with the son of God, not to have more power. I want more power, but that's not the thing I want the most. The thing I want the most is to uh, feel his pleasure in me and to, and to have joy in him. Oh, I love it. Thank you for emphasizing that. Jack, one of the things that I always ask folks is uh, my title of my podcast is More to the Story. And I ask that question for you personally, like, well, there's, uh, is there more to the story of Jack Deere? Is like there a hobby that you don't get to talk about a lot of times or something that you really like to do that people might not know about you? Uh, yeah, I'm a hunter. Okay. I like hunting. I'm a, I'm a shooter um, uh, of every uh, shooter, pistols, rifles, shotguns. I can actually teach uh, shotgun shooting. Okay. Um, so, and, and I was a bow hunter and when I lived in, uh, Montana, I was a bow hunter. I've got an elk with a bow and I oh, can wow. quarter an elk and, and pack it out, uh, off the, out of the mountain. So yeah, I don't get to do that now in Memphis, but that's, that would be my favorite, uh, hobby. Oh, that's fun. Well, thanks for sharing that. We're not too far from you. We're down three hours in Jackson. Love to interact with you sometime. And um, we, we okay. teach classes on spiritual warfare here, and uh, we'd love to engage you more. But we're so thankful for this book, for your ministry. I'm sorry it's taken me this long to come to know you, but uh, know about your work. But I really appreciate it. Where can people find things about your ministry and, and various things connected to you? Uh, just look on the internet. That, that's the bad thing is uh, I, I'm a horrible tech person, so I don't have a website. Uh, some, some guys, uh, I'm hopefully get, get, getting ready to connect with some guys that can build a website for me, but right now, uh, I don't have anything. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll make sure to put some links to some of your books here and teaching that people can access. Jack, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It means a lot to me. Thanks, Andy. Enjoyed being with you. God bless you. <laughs>